I'd say it took a few years here in the isolation unit that they had the um, women on death row in. And um, at one point, they, the prison system, brought two of the women that we had lived with at that time and they committed a bank robbery, not a bank robbery, some kind of a robbery, gun store, I think. And then they put them in the unit with um, Pat and Susan and I. And as they began to um, talk, I realized that I w had moved away from their world and how they were thinking. And I had started to identify more with the personnel here because that was basically who I had to talk to. It was a very isolated area. And um, I would say that probably started it. And um, over the years... Was that after your death sentence that had been overturned? Uh, yeah. Also that, that kind of kicked it in when it was no longer the matter of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I realized that I would be living with this and I better learn how. Sure. Okay. Well, there, there may be other questions from the other commissioners. I'm going to move on and just talk a little bit about your prior criminal history. And you had uh, several arrests. Uh, it seems like they all started in 1969. They were all, all of my arrests were um, at the time that I lived with um, Charles Manson. Okay, yeah, they were all somehow related. Uh, to the group. Yes, exactly. I noticed that in, 19, in April of 1969, you had been arrested for a grand theft auto. But it turned out that that was one of the vehicles that had been, I guess, uh, donated to the family, I think it was? Maybe. Maybe. What, okay. what the uh, local police would do is come and arrest all of us in hopes of weeding us out. And then we wouldn't be arraigned. So well, there like were several arrests for a grand theft auto. At least there were at least three. Uh, one in April, one in August, and one in October of 1969. All three of them for Grand Theft Auto. Uh, there were no charges, or you were released on the first one, no charges on the second one. Uh, then there was no disposition shown on the third one. And you also had an arrest in September of 1969, and that was for, for burglary, but really what in essence it was is you'd gone into a store to use a stolen credit card. Yes. Do uh, you know where that credit card came from? It came from a burglary. Okay. Had you been in part of that burglary? No. All right. You just knew that it was a stolen card? Yeah. Okay. And you got it from whom? Um, Nancy Pittman had it, and I'm not sure exactly where it had come from. So from, from what I'm hearing you say and from what all that we've, that we've read, uh, this family that Mr. Manson talked about was really kind of a criminal group. It was kind of a gang of, of, of criminals. And you sustained, sustained yourselves by going out and stealing and uh, uh, robbing? In the beginning, it was more of a uh, communal in the sense of the 60s. In the winter, early winter of 69, um, that's when Manson began to take on a more ominous tone. Up until then, there weren't burglaries, there weren't the um, little games he'd set up of us trying to sneak up on each other and um, uh, preparation for the revolution. In the beginning, it was uh, that he was a Christ figure, if not Christ, and we uh, lived in a different way like that. Okay. So it, it, it escalated into exactly what you said. It became a criminal enterprise almost. It became a gang of... of uh, we weren't together enough. At one, point, at one point when he realized how devoted each of us were, then he tried to set up like a prostitution and that didn't work because we were um, a little too far out on the drugs. And I was playing hide and seek with elves in the woods and all of that. And, and I think that if he could have probably exploited us in a different way, it might have gone there. 
So you mentioned the drugs, and I wanted to get to that very briefly. On the night of the crimes, you were not uh, under the influence of drugs, but you were using psychedelic drugs quite a bit during that yes. period of time? Uh, acid? Yes. LSD? Would you use anything else, any stronger drugs, cocaine, heroin? No. It was no. primarily marijuana? Uh, LSD and um, marijuana, hashish. Okay, those are the things. Now and then a little bit of methamphetamine, but mainly LSD. Okay. Uh, just to talk very briefly about your personal history, uh, you were born in Altadena, California. Yes. Uh, you have an older brother, Paul. Yes, I do. Uh, you have, I think, a uh, stepbrother and sister? They were adopted. They were adopted. Okay, and, uh, and you graduated from Monrovia <clears throat> High School. And uh, did you go to high school at all? Yes. Did you? I'm, I'm, I don't mean high school, I'm sorry, college. Did not you until not until I came. Oh, I went to a year of business school. Okay, and that was the only schooling that you had. Yes. Uh, were you ever married? Once in here. And that was it. Yeah. And that's ended in a divorce. Yes, it did. So you have no children. No, I do not. No. Leslie Van Houten, that was in 1998 parole board hearing, and again tomorrow, her 14th time before the parole board, her 13th time requesting her freedom. I think uh, the, I don't really wouldn't take a parole anyway, not really. I'm thinking, uh, you know, I'm here, we're going through the changes of it, but uh, I would like to go back to court. I'd like to get my chance, my day in court. Charlie Manson may say he doesn't want parole, but tomorrow, former Manson follower Leslie Van Houten will be back before a board of commissioners asking that she be let out of prison. Playings of Lino LaBianca and his wife Rosemary LaBianca. For those murders, Van Houten was sentenced to death. When the death penalty was found to be unconstitutional in California, her sentence was commuted to life with the possibility of parole. In anticipation of Van Houten's latest bid for parole tomorrow, we're reviewing her last attempt. And as we return to that hearing, Van Houten is being questioned about her activities in prison. The last time you appeared before the board was April 20th, 96. Uh, and um, the, according to the board report, uh, there's a number of informational chronos that have been generated since that time. Uh, thanking you for uh, being a tutor, and yes, I can too, and Voices Within Project, and uh, then you were assisted uh, in the AANA banquet, and uh, uh, CODA, and uh, you had exceptional grades as a program two relief clerk, and uh, there were many positive comments on those indicating uh, things like uh, meets job expectations, demonstrates good work ethics, and uh, needs minimal supervision. Your classification score is zero. Uh, you've also been involved in uh, Save Our Stitches, uh, let's see, the reading project for the visually impaired. Uh, you've been involved in group psychotherapy. You've completed electronic data processing. Now, was that since the last time? No, I completed that um, before this last, it, in 96, I had already completed it. Okay, because you were in word processing, and then I thought... No, was I was it? in data. Oh, you were in data? Yeah. Okay, then you went to they, Well, they had um, software packets of word. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, and that was prior to 96? Yes. Okay, yeah, and I saw the completion certificate in there. Uh, anything else we should know about uh, what you've been doing in the last couple of years?